If you want your business to grow very quick, be so obsessed and focused on creating a product or service that when you deliver it to the customer, they can't help but talk about it. That's the goal, right? Is that product or service? (laughs) Yes, thank you. (laughs) Service-centric businesses are the ones that stand the test of time. I remember watching an interview uh, a while back. I think it was like a three-minute interview with Jeff Bezos, and he said the term customer experience 97 times in a three-minute interview. I can't watch an interview with most marketers where they say customer experience once in an hour. (laughs) What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Travis Makes Friends. Today, I'm making friends with Keala Kanai. Um, we just recorded this interview and let me tell you, this was one of my favorite conversations I've had in a while. Um, I don't know if it was because of the magic mind that we took like, uh, like 20, 30% of the way through you guys tell me, cause, cause if you're watching the video, you can watch me take the magic mind and then we just like go off on these crazy uh, rabbit trails on life philosophy and things. Uh, uh, we, we just get into some really cool, intense conversations around the, around that stuff. Um, we talk about Amazon and their business model and why they're so successful. Uh, we talk about his journey from going from, uh, being a, a barista to making his first million dollars online. And then subsequently how he has now generated over $100 million in just six and a half years of running online businesses. Um, and then uh, we talk about paid media versus organic traffic. Uh, we talk about, um, about several different business models that work or don't work. Uh, we talk about why lottery winners go broke, how Alex Hermosi uh, really rose to success and, and fame uh, recently. Uh, there's, there's so many things that we cover in this episode. Um, we just have a really great time, so I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Um, Keala is an, inter- an internet and affiliate marketer who basically turned into a business owner by teaching other people how to do what he did, you know, break out of the nine to five and start affiliate marketing businesses. But the thing that I really like about him, respect about him is that he is not the stereotypical, um, scammy internet marketer. He actually had a kind of a mental breakdown, which we talk about in the show where he was making uh, almost $2 million a month, but in severe depression, anxiety, and even having suicidal thoughts during that time period. And he had to redo everything that he was working on. His, his, his focus shifted from customer acquisition to customer experience. He changed everything about his business, moved into the CEO seat. Um, and now his life is uh, better than ever. He's got more free time, makes more money, makes more profit. Um, and uh, just a really incredible story of resilience and continuing to level up and become a different version of yourself, um, which we also talk about quite a bit in this episode. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Keala Kanai. Uh, well, first off, we typically go like directly into backstory, but uh, I thought it'd be fun to shake things up a little bit yeah. and just go directly into uh, what you're working on right now. So um, just for a little wow factor to start this episode off and get people to keep listening for the rest of this episode, <laughs> why don't you tell us how much you've now made in your business online to date? I'm about one hundred and one million so far, and about in the last like six and a half years or so. A hundred and one million in six and a half years. Yeah, and you started that as a side hustle before you went full time. Yeah, I mean, I got started as an affiliate marketer in, in, initially. Yeah, um, while I was working in a coffee shop, earning minimum wage, and then uh, after about seven months of that, I was able to quit my job, had my first five figure month made my first million dollars purely as an affiliate marketer. And then, you know, people kept asking me to teach them about like Facebook ads or copywriting or funnel building or all the different things that I was doing. And that turned into a courses and coaching business, which has now scaled up past nine figures. Where essentially you teach affiliate marketing. Exactly. And we still do affiliate marketing. We do about somewhere between five to $7 million a year, just as an affiliate as well. So we're doing what we teach sure. also. Are you buying traffic for that or just email list only for that business, the affiliate stuff? Oh, no. I mean, we, yeah, we run quite a bit of traffic. Uh, and the majority of our affiliate sales these days will come actually from our list for like any non buyers of our offers. We push in other offers. And then we also do occasionally like a JV type thing where we push somebody else's offer okay. occasionally. Great. So one of the reasons that I like doing the show is I like to expose the audience into different paths. And this is one of those ones that, um, frankly, like if I were going to go back and, and start over. I wish that I would have gotten into affiliate marketing when I started my podcast. Um, because when I started the podcast, frankly, I had no idea how to make money online. I just wanted to do something online. So I started a podcast because I didn't know what else to do. And I was listening to a bunch of podcasts. So I figured like, oh, let's be cool. And, uh, but it didn't make any money. <laughs> you know what I mean? For a long time. Like I didn't realize at the time that I was building brand. I wasn't like being a marketer. <clears throat> and those are 
you know, two different things. And, uh, you know, now I'm grateful for the brand that, that, that we took a long time to build, but I also lost out on, I think really fast growth opportunities and, um, and then securing myself and my family financially because I like didn't do a lot of those things. So, um, we're, we're going to get into a, a few things here later on, but can you just break down for somebody why affiliate marketing can be a really good entry point if you have no idea and of any of the words we just said, copywriting, email marketing, like funnels, you have no idea what any of that stuff is. Why is affiliate marketing a good place to to start? Yeah, that's a really good question, and uh, kind of you know, it's probably the the reason that I fell in love with it as a as an idea. Anyway, is um, so affiliate marketing is basically just selling somebody else's products or services and earning a commission by doing it. So you don't have to have any of your own products services. You don't have to deal with any fulfillment customer hassles, merchanting, like any of the stuff that it typically takes to run like a legit business, right? You don't need any employees, any of the drama. And the thing that I think is attractive for most people like yourself, what you're describing is basically that you're creative, right? Like you want to produce some sort of content. Um, you want to talk to cool people. You want to engage with cool folks. And then, you know, if, uh, if you had added affiliate marketing into your monetization strategy earlier in the game, it would have allowed you to basically get paid to learn from a bunch of smart folks. So there's a lot of content creators out there. There's a lot of influencers out there. There's a lot of people that are like, they just have that creative mindset and they don't necessarily want to go build a whole business. But if they're willing to build out content, create content, build a following, create some sort of an influence, it's easy for them to find other products. So if you find something that you're like really inspired about, really yeah. passionate about, you know, you jump out of bed every morning and you're excited to go do this thing, then can you find ancillary products or services that are around that market that you can push your audience's attention to and therefore monitor? monetize that attention and then be, you know, be, be, basically be able to like fund the growth of your audience. There's something that you can push back into the business. Right. <laughs> uh, and so I, I find it as like a really cool way for people to earn an income. If one, they have no idea what product or service to sell, uh, but they know they want to be an entrepreneur or if they want to be a creative of some sort and they don't want to deal with the whole, you know, hassle of building an actual business and enterprise. Yeah. It was funny, dude. Um, I was meeting with, um, it was Chris record um, back in the day, like, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago, when I was first starting my podcast and I was like making great traction with my podcast. And we sat down to lunch or dinner or something one time. And he was like, bro, I went into like your system and stuff. And I, I didn't find what it is that you're, that you're doing. Like, what are you, what are you actually doing? I'm like, I have a podcast. And he's like, no, no, no. Right. But like, you know, what, what are you selling? Like, what's your business? And I was like, I, I podcast. I don't know. What do you mean? You know what I mean? I was just like, I was so lost. And I look back and I was like, oh man, so many missed opportunities. But you know, everybody has, everybody has their discovery path. Um, how did you first happen upon uh, affiliate marketing and think, oh, I'm, I think I could do that. Oh, uh, that's an interesting story. So what, uh, I started my first business in 2000, the year between which I graduated high school. I was in the summer between uh, high school and college. Uh, and I was, you know, going to go to the university of Hawaii. Um, and some friends of mine and I, we used to throw these hotel parties and eventually the parties got big enough that people would actually just pay to come to the party. And we're a bunch of dumb degenerate kids. So we just had like stupid rules, like bring two girls for every guy, a case of beer for every person in your party or pay us 20 bucks to get in and start, people started paying us. And that spun off into eventually us like having our own nightclub promotions business. Um, so we would, you know, try to find nightclubs that we could promote. People pay to get in. We get to keep that money at the pay at the door. That thing failed for three and a half years. But in the process, I had brochures, um, you know, business cards. I, I made fake IDs for us because we, none of us were 21 and we quickly figured out that if we want to make real money, we had to like Hilarious. be able to pr uh, promote a nightclub that sold alcohol. Three and a half years is a long time to fail, bro. <laughs> well, most people so, won't even stick with something for three and a half I'm weeks, saying. right? That's what I'm saying. So I'm sticking with that's it for three and a half years, failing miserably. But that was my introduction into the world of like entrepreneurship. And then basically for the next 12 years, I failed miserably at all sorts of things. I joined all sorts of uh, network marketing companies, direct sales businesses, did um, knock, I did, I knocked on doors. I tried to sell loans as a mortgage broker going into, or a, mor a loan officer. Uh, that was going right into the financial collapse, Perfect. actually. So I thought, it was, <laughs> I thought that I was like, it's always this hard to sell loans, but no, it's like actually the rugs being pulled out from under the industry. Like, now you have to get licensed and shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So now you got to actually look out for the customer. Crazy. Yeah, thought. Right. Um, so, you know, I just tr tried all sorts of stuff, even some like extra legal businesses. We wouldn't say illegal because that would be bad. <laughs> I'd say they're extra legal. They were beyond <laughs> the limits of the law. And so, <laughs> and all of those didn't work either. And uh, come to about two th 2010, 
uh, I was trying to sell a real estate investment uh, program and I couldn't do the whole make a list of your friends and family and call them because I had already beaten that. Burned through them like 12 <laughs> yeah. times. Yeah. I was basically. Saw them cut co and like oh, yeah. solar or All whatever else. Stuff. Yeah. I'm like, guess, guess what I'm into now. <laughs> yeah, right. Come to this hotel uh, meeting. <laughs> don't pay attention to the circles on the whiteboard that look like a pyramid. You know? <laughs> Just get three oh, people who get three people. Just like Michael Scott. Just... <laughs> yeah. like, I got to make some calls. <laughs> so uh, I had done all that. My family had basically probably saved my name in their phone as do not answer. And so I had gone on, on Google one day and I just started Googling like how to generate leads online. Uh, and that just took me down this rabbit hole of learning about you know, affiliate marketing, online marketing, online advertising, and all these things. And what originally caught my attention is I would find uh, some of these people that had their own online businesses who would be on vacation for quite some time throughout the year and still be earning money even while they're on vacation. And I was like, that sounds like the American dream to me. And uh, basically, they had, and it's because as marketers or digital marketers, we tend to find ways to automate a lot of things, right? Uh, so I became fascinated by that, but I never really, and I bought courses and watched a ton of videos and bought ebooks and, you know, ebooks and physical books and all this stuff. With all the leftover money you had in your yeah, bank account. With, yeah. yeah. <laughs> with all the tons of money that I had in my account. Uh, and then what happened is, um, so I never really took it too seriously. I did, uh, you know, I, I, I dabbed in it, I guess, a, a bit, but, um, come 2012, I give, uh, August 13th, 2012, I walked into my mom's bedroom while she was folding some laundry and stuff. And uh, I was living in her spare bedroom at the time. And she's like, what do you need? And I was like, uh, hey, mom. So I was just wondering if you had that uh, box of uh, that cardboard box that you're going to take down to Goodwill for that friend of yours. And she's like, yeah, I still have it. But what do you want with it? And I was like, well, tomorrow's Tiani's birthday and I don't really have any money to get her anything. So I was hoping that I could go like find a purse or something in that cardboard box. Is your girlfriend at the time? Yeah. And I mean, we're, uh, engaged now, but I mean, we had already been together at that point, seven years. Oh, wow. And there had been a point in which in that time, there was a point in time where she used to sleep in a car with me. Um, and she wasn't homeless. I just was kind of temporarily homeless. And here I am like, now I can't even afford to get her a gift for her birthday. And I ended up going shopping that evening shopping, uh, in a cardboard box. Uh, and I pulled out this old used purse. Uh, I put it in a Macy's box that my mom had laying around. I put a bow on it. And on August 14th, 2012, I gave her somebody else's trash for her birthday. Uh, and that kind of became this moment where I was like, this, yeah, this cannot continue, right? I got to make that. I made that solemn oath. I'm figuring a way out of this. Uh, so why, why, why was your way out of it? to continue down the path that was beating you up for the last few years rather than like go get a secure job? Man, that's a good question. Cause you know, just being perfectly honest for like that, that 12 years that I was failing, there was many, 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 many times that I sat up late at night. Um, there's many times I even sat up at night, like with tears in my eyes thinking like, I'm just, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Yeah. You know, maybe I, I should just, is it really that bad if I go get a job and climb the corporate ladder and retire one day? And uh, I don't really know exactly like why I, I, I took on yet another shot at entrepreneurship. I'm grateful that I did, though. Sure. But um, I guess the long and short of it is I just re couldn't really see a way for me to own my future, my destiny, my calendar, you know, my, my financial uh, well-being and be doing that while working for somebody else. Yeah. And you know, I just had bigger goals than that, I guess. Yeah, man, I, that that has to be what it comes down to. Because like you said before, there's a lot of people that will do something for three and a half weeks and then be like, nah, all right, I gave it a shot. That's a scam. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like the MO is like, let me try something. It doesn't work. And then I call it a scam. It definitely isn't me that's the problem. It's definitely the vehicle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but some... It's it's that it's that it's the, something that's unexplainable inside of you that you just you can't shake and it's just like I know I like I don't I don't know if this is going to work at some point but I would rather spend my life trying to figure it out than go to this other path that might even logically make more sense but I just know it's never going to work for me. And that's, that's definitely, definitely how I would explain it for me as well. Cause like it was a very similar story, just kind of like poking around, trying different things, you know, 14 different opportunities, six MLMs, four door to door companies, you know, all this <laughs> other stuff, bro. I found out we used to sell the same thing. What? 
Enagic Kangen water machines. Oh, bro. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I did that back in the day. Although you did it the smarter way after you learned a skill like digital marketing. I was the one like doing the the fucking in-home meetings and the phone calls and demos and all that all that shit. And you probably sold like 12 times more than I did. But uh, that actually led me into this other like door-to-door water machine opportunity where the rips were like $5,000 a piece instead of like 2200 for a K8 or whatever. Um, so it ended up working out just in a different a different <clears throat> you know path. But I thought that was hilarious when I heard you say that. I was like... Oh shit, I didn't know that you used to sell those back in the day. Yeah, we uh, built a um so what happened is uh we had you know been uh, I'd been an affiliate marketer for quite some time and uh basically somebody just showed me like the Enagic compensation plan or whatever and I was like they've got high ticket health and wellness product yep. that pays, you know, into the few thousand dollars per sale. So we ended up building out the front end marketing system with the network marketing offer on the back end, we weren't the face of it. We had uh, some p- other people that played, you know, like the front man for it. Sure. Uh, and yeah, we we blew that thing up so hard that they were changing their compensation plan because of how quickly that we were growing. Yeah. Did you uh, <clears throat> did you run into issues with like payouts and stuff with them? Yeah, there was quite a few issues with payouts. Just in like you know they they would like to pay via a uh, check, check in the mail. Yeah, and you get like. 43,000 checks in the mail that are like, this one's $22. <laughs> this one's $1,000. You spend like an hour and a half at the bank, like just depositing checks. Dude, I have, a, um, when we launched it, I have a picture uh, online. It's even included in some of my advertisements these days uh, where I got 140 checks in the mail. Like imagine showing up at the bank, dude, with 104. <laughs> I, I had freaking a shopping bag full of checks and the... Uh, bank teller is like, uh, this is going to take a little while. You might want to yeah. have a seat. And I sat there for 45 minutes while they <laughs> processed 140 checks or, or no, it was, sorry. It was actually, it was 400 checks for $140,000 is what it was oh, in total. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's yeah, what yeah. it was. So 400 checks totaling 140,000 bucks, bro. This guy, um, in my, my mailman was asking my mom. Uh, what do you guys yeah. do? <laughs> I hope these are checks and not bills. <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I had this guy, uh, this guy in my upline. who was like, he was like one of the top earners in the whole company. He'd been there for like thirty effing years, and he like he still is there today. You know, and he makes great money doing it. Um, but he hired a guy. He literally has like a check guy who just goes to the bank once a week just to deposit checks for him. Like, yep. You have to hire somebody to go deposit checks because yep. that's the volume of checks that you're receiving. Like, hey, maybe stop wasting all the paper and figure out direct deposit. Dude, we like, used to ask him, can you please just do direct deposit? Because I, my, my girl was actually auditing all of our checks and we'd have to let the company know every month the checks that were missing and they would like recut a new check. Mm-hmm. But it literally became like there were so many checks missing that it was worth paying somebody yes, to exactly. audit the checks. Yeah. 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 Yeah, what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good problem but, to have in yeah, comparison sure, to some of the other problems sure, I've had. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was a problem you're you're praying for <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> back in the day. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Okay, so <clears throat> since then, you've now built and 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 uh, made over a hundred million dollars online. So you must have like gone to Harvard to get a master's degree in between that period. Yale, right? actually. Went Yale. To Yale. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. Yeah. Um, it paid off. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, man, just the school of hard knocks, dude. The school of hard, hard knocks for marketing. Uh, and, you know, thankfully learned learned to love it, right? I'm, I'm curious, when you hire people, do you look for, like, certifications or degrees or anything? Especially as, as, when it comes to, like, your executive team, the people that are that are really kind of right hand for you. Are, you. are you wanting them to have, like, these accounting degrees or whatever? you know, the things that you didn't have, are you looking for them to fill the gaps or are you just, Hey, if you can do the job, you can do the job. doesn't matter to me. Uh, so when we're hiring, we don't necessarily look for somebody that has a degree. I mean, it might show up occasionally in their resume. Our, our number one hiring principle is that we hire for proof of past performance, not promise of future potential. So a lot of, uh, early stage entrepreneurs, you know, they want to hire their friends, their family members, people that they know. Oh, I trust them. Oh, I, you know, or, or I know so and so. I bet they'd be great for this job. Right. But it's something that they've never done before. And I went down that route uh, at one point and quickly learned that that just was not going to work. And so, especially when it comes to the executive team, I'm more so looking for, have you already solved the problem that we're hiring you to solve? Um, like how many people had like, you know, how big of a department have you run before? How many people have reported to you? What sort of innovations did you make? Uh, what, what are some big problems that you ran into in your position uh, that, 
you know, you were able to solve. Tell me a little bit about that. What are some failures that you've had where you wish you would have done things differently? What did you learn from that? These are some of the questions that I ask. One of my favorite questions in an interview is if you were me interviewing you, what question would you be asking yourself? And then they'll start to be like, what the fuck? You know, that takes some thinking, right? And they got to think for a little bit. And they're like, well, I guess I'd want to know da 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 And like, great. So now I want to know that. Um, but long and the short of it is I just want to look for somebody that I know from their past, they've already done the thing. And I don't care if they have a degree or not, because a degree doesn't tell me whether or not you can actually execute. Sure. Yeah. And then, and then culture values fit. I would rather have somebody who is a great culture fit and, and good in their role versus somebody who's great in their role, but only a good culture fit because skills I can teach, right. Or my team can teach, but character which is really what culture is all about. Character can't be taught. That's like, they're going to come with whatever they got, right? And maybe you can shift your character over time, but that's a way longer investment and than much skills. more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to first be willing to even want exactly. to change. Yeah. Right? right. Which a lot of times is the, is the value piece that's missing exactly. is that they don't view themselves as ever being the problem. Exactly. They view everybody else as always being the problem and it's never their fault. You know right. what I mean? It's like, well, we can't do really, we can't really do anything with that. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, the great thing about good leaders, typically good leaders, like one of our leadership philosophies in the business is probably them, definitely me. So it means anything that goes wrong in the business, any issue that we're having with customers, with refunds, with, you know, an, a process issue in the business or with a team member in the business, the first question as a leader is, okay, it's probably them, but it's definitely me. So what did I do? Where did I drop the ball? What could I do differently? Where did I miscommunicate? Where did I mismanage expectations? And I think like that is like a key principle for leadership is to first own it. Um, because if it's always somebody else who caused the problem, then it's up to somebody else to solve the problem. Right. And, it, and then if then, then basically that's like saying that, you know, my future is in their hands. Like that's just not going to work. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Or that's what, that's when you just start cycling through people. Right. You're, you're hoping for this savior to come along and right. do everything. Magically. And nobody's coming to save you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, well, listen, dude, there, there's, a uh, <clears throat> several things that, that I wanted to chat with you about in the, uh, the marketing world, but I want to kind of set that aside right now because, um, I know some, something that I respect about you and something that I respect really about just the best marketers that I know. And these aren't necessarily the people who, um, are the best at marketing. They're just the best marketers because they've evolved beyond just being a marketer, um, and moved into this seat of being a real business owner. And there's not very many of them that have done that. To be honest, yeah, because there, there's a ceiling, right? There, there's a ce- there. You bump up against the ceiling when you're in the, you know, for me, it was being a salesperson. For you, it's being a marketer. Like you bump up against this ceiling that you you can't go past this stage of the business without completely adapting yourself to become a different version of yourself. Like well, before we turn the mics on, you were saying like you're not even really in the marketing in your business anymore, right. which has to feel weird for you because like in your core, your DNA is your marketer, um, but you have stepped into the role of CEO so that you can operate and run the entire business effectively. And that came as a result of basically, from what I understand, you were focused so much on marketing and sales and acquisition that you grew and scaled so much, like really fast, like from zero to a million a month in a matter of less than a year. We went from zero, we launched and went from zero to a million a month in four months. Yeah. I mean, that's 20 million our first year. Um, Yeah. That that's unheard of. And, uh, and, the, the, the fact that you, you were even able to recover from that is still mind blowing, but you, obviously there was a time period where you say, you know, you were even in a state of depression, almost suicidal. You had, you're, you're, you're doing 1.5, 1.8 million a month, top line revenue, and then start realizing that you're losing 300 grand a month, even though you're making a hundred, like 1.5, 1.6, 1.7. It's like, what is happening? Cause now you're a marketer and you're thrust into this massive business. And now you're running into all the other problems that a business has, which you don't think about as a marketer. You're, you're thinking acquisition. You see that top line moving up. You're like, we're winning. And then you take a peek behind the curtain. You're like, wait a second, how do we lose 300? Like, how does our bank account have less money in it this month than it did last month? But our revenue says that we made $1.8 million. How did that even happen? So, so talk me through your transition. You know, when did you embrace that role of moving from, Hey guys, I'm a marketer to like, no, I need to be the CEO and I need to have an understanding of what's happening in every aspect of my business. Man, so this is going to be a little bit of a story, but I, uh, and I, but I will, pro- I will say that it's probably worth it. And it's like one of these things that, like, I think every 
some everyone who is aspiring to be you know an, an enterprise level entrepreneur has to kind of go through uh and mo- almost everybody like you talked about marketers who've evolved into a ceo and actually been able to build something that's like a real legitimate standing business they've all gone through this sort of evolution in their own ways um and so yeah we launched and scale so we launched november of 2016 we opened our doors to the public with our courses and coaching program by march of 2017 we had our first million dollar month we scaled to like 19 million and some change by the so almost 20 million dollars in revenue by the end of 2017 <clears throat> and i thought that when i got to that place in my business when i got to like a million dollars a month or whatever i thought that there would be some sense of fulfillment or satisfaction or happiness that was found there and really there wasn't there was actually like a real vast emptiness that was found there because i thought that somehow the money was going to make me happy let's say um realized fairly quickly that that was not what was going to make me happy and i found myself in this place where all of a sudden i had like 60 something employees uh i had uh all of these different financial issues i spent much more of my time on meetings and and working through issues and problems in the business and people problems and process problems and all these things uh than i did actually doing the thing that i loved which was marketing right uh and so i eventually fell into this you know, several month long depression, that depression, uh, why it originally started out as like some severe anxiety, I would get up in the morning, and I would instantly start having panic attacks, like before I even got out of bed, and I would not want to get out of bed. It's a good way to start the day. Great way to start the day. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot what stage that is in Tony Robbins morning routine. But (laughs) yeah, panic and anxiety. I forget where that goes, like somewhere between meditation and like cold plunge. (laughs) It was like journaling, panic attack. (laughs) (laughs) So Yep, I'd wake up, I'd have a panic attack, man, uh, on many mornings, get in the shower, try my best to 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 get through it. Um oftentimes I would have to take a shit uh take a shit take a, take a shot. Same with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're on the same page, bro. Panic attack, meditation, One in the same. shit. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We're, but I'd take a shot sometimes just to like take that edge off a little bit and then plug into work and then I'd find myself drinking myself to sleep at night just to wind back down. Uh and so it started out as an anxiety. It eventually rolled into a depression. I then went on a vacation to Hawaii to take a break and I thought that that would give me some space to like chill out and relax. And in fact, the depression got worse while I was in Hawaii. Uh, and that's when like the suicidal star- thoughts started to kick in. And now I'm like thinking like, oh my God, am I going to off myself? Like, and all this sort of stuff. And so I, I started looking for, for help. And the long and the short of it is, so I went through this process for several months. But the long and the short of it is, I, I over time, I, I, you know, I, I talked to a psychologist um, who I had started seeing originally when I was like 16 years old because I went and I ended up in anger management and all this shit because uh, I was getting lots of fights and stuff in school. Um, that was my way of coping with a, my parents' divorce. And, um, so I go back to see him. I, I hire a couple of coaches that I'd met along the way. Uh, thankfully I had a lot of personal development experience prior to that. And I don't mean just reading personal development books. I mean, like going back and looking at my traumas in life and trying to heal those traumas so that I could bring more of myself to the, to the present, to the table in my business. So I hired a couple of my coaches. I went back to see a psychologist and I start to work through this stuff. And one of the biggest epiphanies that I found is that, um, I was, doing all this stuff every day that was no longer the stuff that I love doing. And I either needed to scale the business back and learn how to and and build something that where I could just do this thing that I love doing, or I had to learn to fall in love with the new role that I was being called to do. Right. Um, And so I think that that's the evolution that most of us as entrepreneurs have to go through because most entrepreneurs start out as a technician, like they're great at something, right? Oh, I love baking. I want to open a bakery. And so, well, you open a bakery and now you never fucking bake again, right? Uh, I love marketing and sales. So I want to teach people marketing and sales and people keep asking me about it. So I'm going to create this courses and coaching business and I'll get to talk all about marketing and sales. And now I never talk about marketing and sales, right? And so, and now I'm dealing with all these human resources issues and accounting drama and all this, looking at balance sheets and all this stuff that I can't understand. And so I think, so the overwhelming majority of entrepreneurs uh, will actually reach that point, that breaking point, and then they eventually scale their business back down uh, and they never push past that limit. And I'm not saying that you should, I'm just saying, I mean, at some point just decide, right? 
what I did is I decided like I need to fall in love with this new role that I was doing. And so uh, thankfully, I had kind of a, a model, a framework to work off of. It comes from a Dr. John D. Martini, who's easily my favorite like probably the brightest human being walking the earth that almost nobody knows of. Um, and his model is called the hierarchy of values, which comes from a field of study known as axiology, which is a study of value of, and worth. And uh, through the hierarchy of values, which I talk about a lot because it's the most universally sound principle that I've ever found from a teleological perspective. And teleology is the study of uh, why things happen, not in the form of what causes them, but in the form of what purpose do they serve? And so uh, a lot of the challenges that we face as human beings, procrastination, hesitation, frustration, overwhelm, self-sabotage, imposter syndrome, those actually serve a purpose, believe it or not. And the hierarchy of values model that was uh, derived by Dr. Demartini um, helps explain what some of that purpose is. But I, I looked then at my values, like what did I really value in life? And I, I learned that I had to like link my values to the things, the activity that I had to do in my business every day. Like I didn't love reading legal contracts. I didn't love looking at accounting spreadsheets. I didn't love, you know, getting on 50 meetings a week. I didn't love, you know, dealing with people problems and their infighting and their drama and stuff. I didn't love those things. But then I had to figure out, okay, but if I, if I do have a high value on building financial independence, well, then how is me reading legal contracts going to be a benefit and service to my value of building financial independence? How is, you know, under Understanding human resource issues is going to be a benefit and service to my value of building financial independence and really linking those things together. So the way that Dr. Demartini explains it is that when it comes to your values, right, you can either uh, love what you do by delegation, which means that you get rid of all the things that you don't truly value doing, or uh, do what you sorry do what you love by delegation, which means that you just do the things you love and delegate everything else, or learn to love what you do by linking it back to your values. And so, I, you know, I, I've had to do a bit of both, right? I do a, a lot of delegation, obviously, or I wouldn't be able to have the enterprise level business that we have right now, which I guess you would call about a medium sized business and and growing. Um, but I also, along the way, at times, still even till today, have to find ways to link these tasks that are on my plate, these things that I have to do, uh, that I, you know, quote unquote, have to do, like listen to our language. Our language tells us a lot about how we're actually operating subconsciously, right? So have to do, need to do, ought to do, should do. These are all things that we say when we're trying to, when we're trying to uh, approach something that doesn't link back to our values. And so when, when our uh, conscious mind can't link together something uh, that we're doing or a goal that we have, and if it, if it can't link that back to our values, it spits out that feedback in the terms of our language. But when I find myself doing things that I feel like I have to do, need to do, ought to do, should do that I don't really want to do, uh, and I'm coming up in a resistance against, and I'll sit and I'll ask myself, okay, well, how is doing this? How is solving this problem in my business? How is executing this task going to be a benefit and service to the things that I do value in my life? And I'll look for those links so that I can, you know, learn to love what I am called to do on this journey that is entrepreneurship. You know? Yeah, I love that answer, man. L <clears throat> linking values back to the things that you don't enjoy doing to give you a sense of purpose behind them. Or yeah, I, um, I was, oh, man, I forget the book I was reading recently, but essentially said something very similar to that. It was talking about linking your purpose, your why, mm -hmm. to the, to things that you don't super enjoy. Um, and it and it got me thinking about like, hey, if this is something that I'm not like if, if I'm selling something that I'm not like super passionate about, but it helps fulfill like some sort of a why, like it, if I could really understand the why behind it, then you can really start to fulfill that role. Um, you know, and in that particular scenario, you can sell more effectively. You can have more confidence in your offers. You can, you can, um, you know, lead more effectively, but in this scenario, <clears throat> it essentially saved your life. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of like, probably oh, in I, a very real sense, it yeah, saved my life. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, is philosophy something that you think a lot about now? It sounds like you kind of had this journey of like hustler, 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 hustler for 12 years and then entrepreneur, marketer, and then, oh no, everything's going terribly, even though theoretically it's going really well. And now I'm becoming this like this modern day philosopher because I have to figure out first how to get my own mental state under control so that I can go back and do the things that I enjoy doing because if I don't feel, figure that out first, it was almost like you went entrepreneur, philosopher, then CEO. Um, do you feel like you still think a lot about that stuff now? Like, would you say, would you say that you found at least some sort of purpose or meaning or happiness or joy, you know, 
after the reset? I would say that the evolution probably looked more like failed entrepreneur, philosopher, successful entrepreneur, revisiting philosophy to like to take me through to that next stage of my own evolution. Okay. Um, philosophy is like, so that that's just something that I came across in the world of personal development, yeah. right? Um, and going to seminars and doing these experiential things and retreats. And I mean, I mean, I slept for two days in the fucking woods by myself, like yeah. vision quests and all these weird things. Okay. <laughs> Um, but philosophy is probably what helped me to kind of formulate a set of principles and belief systems that allowed me to go from failed entrepreneur to somebody who could actually be successful, yeah. right? Um, and I, I say this a lot. We even, it's, it's a part of our core curricul curriculum is that, you know, success is the marriage of skill set and mindset. Um, <clears throat> so philosophy helped me develop the mindset that was necessary, uh, as well. And so, I, here's what I find, man, is I find like the most successful people that I know, uh, like last night I was at dinner with a guy who just acquired 49 businesses last year in a roll up, uh, and is on the cusp of exiting this thing for 150 to 175 million. And he's got four buyers on the, on the uh, table right now. And then I'm sitting next to a guy, uh, who has one of the largest VC funds in the world. And inevitably what we end up talking about is some philosophy that we have that's helped us achieve that success in life, right? Um, if you look at Hormozy got super popular right now, and I used, I've hung out with Hormozy in the past, um, really, really smart dude. But if you look at like some of his interviews that have done the best, it's where he starts to transition into his own philosophies Absolutely. about business and success and life, right? And so I think that to some degree, you know, as part of our evolution, especially when we're reaching for new heights to, to places that we've never been before, we've got to create some sort of philosophy around who we are, how we fit into the world. We, we create models about the world and our and how we fit into that. Uh, and for, through that philosophy, we develop some sort of like principles or models that we use to kind of understand and problem solve. I was reading something recently that said that um, science is the exploration of what we know and philosophy is the exploration of what we don't. Mm. It's asking the questions that are almost unquantifiable, can't fully be measured, can't fully even be answered, right? And if science does find a way to catch up and answer it, then a new philosophical question opens opens up uh, as a new gateway yeah. to the next threshold of understanding. Yeah, a new line of thinking. Right. Yeah, trying to bridge the gap between what we know and what we don't know. Right. The more that I study this stuff, the more that I like, it's, it's kind of funny. You jump in, everybody's like, Oh, it's all about your mindset. It's about your mindset. And, at the, and I don't know if you were like this at the beginning, but at the beginning I was always like, okay, I get that. But what's, what do I need to do though? Like, mm -hmm. what's the practical, give me the skill set. Like, what do I need to work on? Mm -hmm. You know? And then it, it was like, I almost had a departure from mindset because I got so focused in like practicality. Mm -hmm. But then to your point, if you don't, if you still don't fix that, everything else is, everything else is less important. Mm -hmm. from that point forward because you don't have a strong enough foundation to build anything on mm -hmm. right because all success starts with self-awareness what do you want because you know success is subjective you know, your definition of success is going to be different for me it's gonna be different for him it's gonna be different for her it's gonna be different for everybody so self-awareness which is in your mind and then mindset which is like do you believe that you can go get it mm -hmm. you know if you don't know where you're going and you don't believe that you can go where you want to go then no, like you can learn all the skills in the world and you're never going to get there because you're limited by your own belief or lack thereof in your ability to do so. I, I got a great example of that. Yeah. Um, have you seen the uh, untold the rise and fall of and one? Have you seen that? documentary? Uh, uh, it's actually really funny. I did not watch the documentary, but I interviewed the founder of and one when that documentary came out and I had it on my list and I just never watched it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this isn't, I think it's a perfect example of what we're kind of discussing here. And it's why I, it's, it's a perfect example of why I say that success is both skill set and mindset, right? So specifically what I say is that like skill set without mindset is a nightmare because you wake up every day knowing that you're capable of more, but you can't accomplish it. And other people have what you want. Mindset without skill set, singing kumbaya, lighting candles, making vision boards and, you know, dreaming about fucking paychecks showing up in your <laughs> mailbox without learning a skill set that's going to actually make that happen. That's a fantasy. But if you can marry the two, then you unlock the dream. So uh, Untold is the story of the and one brand, the basketball brand, right? That was like really popular in mid-90s. So let's like recap this really quick as best as I can. 
for those that maybe aren't familiar with the brand. Um, so and one starts out as this basketball brand and they have this dream of competing with Nike, the fucking 800 pound behemoth of the industry. And in their search for how the, how they could compete with Nike, they'd start to decide, they think, well, maybe we should sponsor some athletes, except all the athletes are outside of their price range and or already sponsored by some other big brand, Reebok, Adidas, Nike, whatever it is, right? So somebody tells them to go check out these bad, these, um, you know, street ballers playing in up in like upstate New York. They go to visit this, uh, basketball game, like in the Bronx, I think it was somewhere. And they find this unseen, you know, uh, experience where there's hundreds of people gathered around a public street ball court to go watch a bunch of street ballers play an ex- exhibition game. People are hanging out of their housing projects, like whole families have come over and they're hanging out the windows of their housing projects, looking down on this game. And it's got this massive crowd that it's drawn. And so these founders are st- sitting there, they're looking at these basketball players and they are finding that, you know, they have all this fancy footwork and they've kind of created their own new wants to the game of basketball. Now, NBA at the time thought that that sort of play was like, quote unquote, unprofessional. So what they did is they decided to go like, why don't we sponsor some of these guys and create like a recreational team? So they sponsor these N1 players. They then start touring across the US doing these recreational basketball games. And then they videotape that they release DVDs. These DVDs get sold in all the athletic stores. These DVDs start going viral. Every this They start building this fan base. And all of a sudden, this N1 basketball brand be starts booming in sales in such to such a degree that Nike does so both the NBA and Nike do start paying attention to what's happening with and one NBA starts to allow some of that behavior in their in into their game because they see that you know if they don't offer their audiences that level of entertainment with all the fancy footwork and and stuff then they're going to lose some of their audience and nike starts looking for these you know uh street ballers that they can start sponsoring so that they can get some uh they can take back some of that market share but what ends up happening that i find most interesting which is really the 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 pinnacle of the lesson here is that these and one players, they end up having their names on the back of jerseys. They're sitting they're They're signing autographs, you know, with hundreds of people in line at their local champ sports and foot locker. They are, they both over time build fame and fortune. Now, are they as, as, as a rich as maybe the NBA players? They don't have contracts quite that big, sure. but you're talking about people that came out of the ghetto. I mean, yeah, you're talking about right. people that came out of, you know, nothing yeah. rising from the it would ashes. Take minimum wage to play basketball. Right. Yeah. I mean, and they're, they're, they're not only getting paid like pretty decent salaries by most people's standards, right. but they're getting p- paid that to do the thing that they love doing. But what, how come we don't hear about and one anymore? Well, in the documentary, they start exploring that like those athletes started all of this infighting with each other about why are you getting paid more than I'm getting paid? And you know, why doesn't the company appreciate us? So why don't they pay us more? Look how much money that we're making them and blah, 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 blah. And all these things start to, they, Tear it tears down the company from the inside out, and that's because these guys. Ha- they, would you argue that they had skills? Anybody who watched them would know that they had skills, but their mindset destroyed their own opportunity. That's self sabotage. Because I would argue that probably likely to some degree, because of their upbringing, their background, and the the lack of like personal development uh, or you know exploration of their own belief systems, they didn't truly believe that they were worthy of having those things, yeah. and so they destroyed it. Yeah, it's uh, what Ed Milet is always, always calls the um, internal thermostat. You know, it's like if your if your internal thermostat set to seventy degrees, you start getting around people that are at eighty degrees, and you start going up, your internal thermostat's immediately going to correct it and bring you right back down to seventy degrees because mm-hmm. you do not believe that you are worth the things that you're that you're you know, right. accomplishing or getting or the the paychecks that you're getting. You have this you have this thing going inside of you. It's like I, I shouldn't be making. This so, type of money. So you find ways to destroy your own success. Yeah, to bring it back down to some place where you feel comfortable. Yeah. So here's an interesting philosophical question. Can your self-worth ever exceed your net or can your net worth ever exceed your self-worth? <sighs> Barring any sort of like outlier lucky circumstance, I don't think so. Well, I mean, even if you look at like uh, lottery winners, man, I mean, you do yeah. the research on them. Yeah, the majority they, of them wish that a they, few months yeah. <laughs> to go broke again. Right. Right. They go broke again, typically. And most of them a lot of professional athletes wish that the they wish that they didn't win the lottery. It actually made their life worse. Right. And yet the right now, 
poor people all across like the majority of tickets sold for the lottery are sold to people like i was just recently recently listening to an audiobook the average person buying a lottery ticket is spending on uh, about 400 Twelve dollars a year, but doesn't have four hundred dollars in their checking account on any given moment. Oh my gosh. Think about that. Oh, now it's hard to understand that mentality, right? Like it might be easy for us to judge sitting from where we're sitting, but to them it might look like, listen, I got no other shot. This sure. is all I got. Yeah. So maybe that's the way that they see it. But then you go look at the people who've actually won it, and if you don't have a sincere reverence for money, right. then you, it will destroy you. Yep. You know. Uh, and so if you come into, if you come into a million, a million dollars, you better become a millionaire quick. Yeah. Right. You know? Better adopt really, that mindset really fast or it's going to be gone as soon as it came into your bank account. I, I think the, the, the most exciting that's, thing that's for me about point. this journey is like, it's not the money. It's who we become in character and mind yeah. that develops the money. The money is just yeah. a feedback yeah, mechanism. You, it's your identity. It's who you, it's the person that's always tell people is like, Stop focusing like your goals shouldn't just be focused on a certain outcome that you have. Your goals should be focused on becoming the person that's capable of achieving that outcome. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and if you focus on becoming that person, then that person is capable of achieving those things. But if you just say like, I want to whatever, make a million dollars, but you've only ever made $35,000 a year, then like going from 35,000 to a million is a massive jump because you likely don't have any of the skills required currently mm -hmm. to get up to a million dollars. Now, lucky for you, there's no special requirements. Like we talked about, you don't have to have an MBA from mm -hmm. Harvard mm -hmm. to go make a million dollars. You can make a hundred million dollars without going to college at all. Like you can do whatever you want. You right. have the ability to do so. Right. So that's the good news. The bad news is that you don't have any of that right now. <laughs> so like you got to start from scratch. You know what I mean? But if your goals are only related to like, I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars in six months, you know, it's like, okay, but, uh, what if you focused on, <clears throat> what if you focused on, instead of saying this, my goal is to, you know, make a hundred thousand dollars. My goal is to take 300 sales calls in the next six months instead of, I want to make a hundred thousand dollars in the next six months. Right. Because the person that takes 300 sales calls is likely more capable of selling a hundred thousand of, 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 of selling a hundred thousand dollars worth of products or services in a month because they've taken 300 sales calls and they've learned over 300 sales calls, what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say, how to respond to this objection and that objection, what tonality to use when they can sense somebody's, you know, feeling uh, off put by the conversation, that person is going to be more capable of achieving that goal. Right. So instead of setting up all these just like arbitrary, that's why nobody keeps up with their new year's resolutions. Like I forget the stat, but it's like 80 something percent of people give up before the month of January is even over. Mm -hmm. And it's because you, there's nothing magical about the switch of the year. There's mm -hmm. nothing magical about the switch of the quarter. It's you have to focus on building yourself to become the type of person that's capable of achieving the things that you want to achieve. And that person can do those things. You mm -hmm. cannot. Mm -hmm. And if you can do the things that you want to do, then you're not aiming big enough. You know what I'm saying like if the current version of you yeah, is is like setting these goals, and you're like, I could totally hit that. Well, you're not thinking big enough then. Right, like you should be putting goals that stretch you and and force you to become a different person because right. that's the person that's going to be capable of doing that. Like the the person that you were before you ran into all those issues with your company is like if you would have just stayed at that identity, it's not like you'd live a bad life. You would probably still be making you know a half a million a month with good profit margins and a small team and just being the marketer. Mm -hmm. You know, but instead you're, you're pushing these crazy revenue numbers with higher profit margins with multiple businesses because you adopted this new identity of becoming the CEO, mm -hmm. because that was the person that you had to become in order to be able to reach the level that you were trying to get to in terms of like the actual numbers and the goals themselves. I love this little rant, by the way. Yeah, this is great. Uh, this, this is uh this is brought to you by magic mind. Um, no, I, I, I gen genuinely, bro. I, is I that what know, happened? I, we I, took this shot, dude, and all of a sudden we're like philosophers, <laughs> yeah. bro. We're channeling like Aristotle and Plato. That's what happens, dude. That's what happens. You take a little bit of magic. Have you taken this stuff before? It's, yeah, it's I've pretty solid. Before. Yeah, yeah, like a little matcha shot, but uh, lots of nootropics. Are you an affiliate? Uh, no. Well, uh, the, were they sent me a bunch of free stuff, so um, so you plug they, them. They might uh, they might end up sponsoring the show. But I told them that I was like, hey, if you guys sponsor or don't sponsor, it doesn't matter to me because I like the product. So and awesome. I like getting free shit. <laughs> right, so go to if you want to get get it, go to magicmind.com yeah. slash, yeah, slash Travis. Travis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll just assume that they're gonna accept the sponsorship terms I sent to them. And uh yeah, uh, go to magicmind.com slash Travis. Pick up pick up a couple of cases. This shit's this shit's really good. Um okay, so uh now you are focused a lot on organic. 
Uh, talk to me about that. So you, you were kind of master of paid marketing. You have a paid digital agency. You guys spend a million a month in advertising for clients and stuff like that. You're also spending a ton on yourself on your own businesses. Um, and now you're, you're looking to get into a little bit more like organic, doing more content, stuff like this, um, stuff like uh, vertical video. Um, talk to me about that. Why and, and what's been working for you? So about that transition into organic, man, this is, and this has been quite the journey. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm at this place where I'm like learning all over again. Yeah. Right? Like I, I know paid marketing really, really well, and I can show almost anybody how to use paid marketing to grow their business. Uh, and the reason that we're venturing into organic right now is basically what I start to see over time is that the cost of the cost of advertising is always going to increase. Okay. So that if the cost of advertising is always increasing, then your cost per impressions is always increasing. Your cost per acquisition is always increasing. So that so it literally means that the cost of acquiring a customer is always going to be increasing for us as business owners. And so the only way then that you can combat that is to continue to increase your average customer value at the same rate that you, that the cost of advertising is increasing. Mm. Now, uh, try that one on for size and see if you can figure out how to grow your customer value at the same rate that the advertising costs are currently rising. It'd be very, very, very difficult. Not to say that it can't be done and it's probably better. It's easier done in some models versus others, depending on where people are at in their business. But we've kind of gotten to a place where like just tacking on yet another high ticket offer so that we could quote unquote increase our average customer value doesn't really do much for us in terms of actually uh, serving the client. Yeah. That's more like us doing something to serve the business over the client, sure. if that makes sense. And so the, uh, the, 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 so I'm looking at like, okay, so how do we continue to combat this? How do we bring down our, our average customer value over time? And the best way that I could find in order to do that, I mean, obviously you can do all the conversion metrics. You can do all the split testing you can do all these things. But it, if I look at organic, which is essentially free traffic, let's call it right. We invest time versus money. Mm-hmm. If I add in the organic component and then we blend the co- the cost per acquisition, what ends up happening is now we are because we have that organic traffic and that organic customer acquisition, we're we're the net cost per acquisition becomes less. Yeah. Okay. And that's probably the best way that I've seen so far to combat the rising cost of advertising. Uh and you know, so that's basically like why I started doing all this YouTube organic and, and Instagram reels and all these different things. The other thing that I found interesting as a byproduct of that that I didn't previously calculate for is as I start to add in YouTube and reels uh, into our you know production, what ended up happening is our lead to front end sale conversion started to increase mm-hmm. and our our customers started to buy more so our customer value increased and so did purchase velocity which by purchase velocity i mean at the speed at which they upgraded mm. with us so it's not just about how much money do they spend but how fast do they spend it because the faster that they spend their money with us the quicker that we become liquid on our advertising costs which allows us to scale up faster okay. what we found in like uh, just polling the audience is that uh, all of a sudden, like more and more people started to report that, oh, I've been watching Cala's YouTube videos for a while. I've been following Cala on Instagram for a while. I know that he knows what he's talking about. You know, so I built that no like, and trust. So before when I did it all through paid advertising, you know, you got on my email list and then I did everything possible to own your inbox, mm-hmm. right? Um, and now, you know, s- consumers today versus like 2016 when I got started, they're much more intelligent uh and they're going to go do the research mm-hmm. and so if i didn't have other things where they could you know see some of my content yeah. then you know they were just going based off of like i guess you know believing that i could help them but, but long and short of it is so what indirectly happened is that we started to convert more of our leads into customers, which directly brings down your cost per acquisition. And those customers started to buy more from us because the no like and trucks factor was much more solidified. So then our average customer value went up and the speed at which they made that purchase increased, which allowed us to get liquid faster on the front and scale up our advertising sooner. If you're starting from, from scratch, do you think that it's possible to build both at the same time? Or do you think like when you look back, are you like, you know what? Yeah, we didn't do organic when I first started. And if we did do that, we'd probably be way further ahead in terms of volume and followers and, and traffic that we're getting on the organic side. However, I did master paid traffic pretty well, and that is like directly tied to our top line revenue growth over those years. Do, do you think it's possible to have done both of them at the same time? 
I don't know if it's really possible to, I mean, I, I, I go back to that saying, he who chases two rabbits catches none. Sure. So I don't know that it's necessarily possible to do um, at the same time. Here's what I've seen though, like recently, I, I've seen this quite a bit actually, is like, I see all these people on, on, on doing their reels and their TikToks these days that are like running a business that's struggling and everybody's doing like kind of like the style of reels and TikToks that Hormozy made really popular, right? And people are starting to think that that's the reason that he's growing. And it's like, no, it's not the reason that he's growing. You know why he's growing? <laughs> he's growing because he launched a super sick book, yeah. right? $100 million offers that went viral. And then in the midst of that virality, this timing could not have been more perfect. Then he has a $50 million exit in yeah. the middle of that virality, which now everybody goes like, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. Right. And boom. He's actually made $100 million. <laughs> yeah. And he wrote a book about making $100 million. There's probably something in there. Yeah. And then he actually spent time writing the book. He didn't hire a ghostwriter to like shit out a product you oh. know what i mean like he he actually like put hundreds of hours you can project. tell that he invested his own personal time in that yeah. book just in yeah. the quality of that book and uh, to be fair and this isn't a dig on the book or him like reading the book there was as a marketer myself a direct response marketer who's been in the industry for years there was nothing that i learned in the book necessarily that was new sure but it was the most well thought out and organized compilation of, of marketing material sure, out exactly. there. Yeah. Put, it was like a freaking manual. It was like a mind meld of like Dan Kennedy, Russell Brunson, and then his own practitioner experience. Yes. You yes. Know? Yeah. And it was like, yeah, it'd be, it was like a user manual for how to create an offer that right. just mops the floor right. in the marketplace. Uh, yeah. And then when you go search, like, who is this guy? It's like, oh, PR piece about he just sold not even the whole company. He sold like 70% of the company to a private equity firm for over $50 million, which is extremely difficult to do in a personal brand education company. Yeah. To, to sell off a piece to a large private equity firm like that. It's, 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 it's difficult to do. Well, and got a lot of that, maybe even all of it, in cash, bro. Yeah. Like that's really hard to do. <laughs> right. You know, yeah, without, somebody without like a five year earn out. For him, for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he built the business in a way that was attractive enough for that private equity firm to, to happen, go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I actually did a post about that the other day. I was like, Hey guys, uh, I don't think it's the yellow text that made Hormozy stuff blow up. So like, you know, if you're just, if you're only focused on this one thing and expecting it to be the thing that's going to make you go viral, it's like, you should maybe go like build a stack of proof first because that's the real reason and not, and it's not, it's not, it's a combination of those things, right? Because obviously not everybody who's, who's built a hundred million dollar company is as well known as Hawks is now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a combination for sure. But without that piece, he's not where he is now, you know, like he has the proof first and then he built the engine second, you know, and he spends, I think the last figure I heard was a hundred grand a month on mm -hmm. on organic just producing content but he's getting like a hundred million impressions a month or something crazy like that from pure organic so you know probably worth it at the yeah. end of the day <laughs> um you're starting a podcast soon is that right uh we've been thinking about doing a podcast for i mean i, I i've kind of been fascinated by the idea of doing a podcast for a few years and then there's just also like trying to f where does that fit into my time and my schedule and my calendar and what's the return on investment going to be there tell me about but it but down the road <laughs> actually travis i came to interview you yeah, about should exactly. i actually do this bro i don't know um but yeah i mean we're exploring doing a podcast i don't know if we'll necessarily do something that that's like the the, the traditional route sure. of doing a podcast um in terms of like weekly episodes or whatnot but here's my theory on the podcast idea as a concept is, and I don't know, I mean, if anybody else wants to steal this and go swipe it and deploy and see what happens, awesome. Uh, but uh, so if I had a studio, which I don't even necessarily need to have a studio, but if I have a podcast and a studio, I have the opportunity to bring people in that I can align my personal brand with, right? So I can bring people in that are further ahead in terms of their personal brand and their reach that already have the captive audience that I want to get, get my uh, brand out to, let's say. I have a reason to bring them in, interview them. And then it's basically becomes, you know, a guilt by association, let's say, Absolutely. right? So just the fact that I'm sitting with them, having that conversation, people wonder, well, who's this person yep. as an example, right? And there's been several times that I've watched a podcast from somebody that I do know being interviewed and I look at the podcaster, I'm like, who's this person? And I go Google them and I try to find out who they are because I've never yep. seen anything from them before. Uh, and if 
if all I had was the platform and the ability to bring them in, and then because of my paid advertising background, I can basically guarantee that, hey, I can get you 250,000, 500,000 views of our interview. Uh, so I know that I can produce that that tangible result for them where yep. most podcasters probably can't produce that tangible result. Right. I don't necessarily care about having all of the episodes. What I have, what I care about is having a carrot that I can dangle to bring people in that are further ahead uh, of where I'm at and that ha- already have my, my ideal audience's attention. And I have a tangible way to ensure that they have something measurable by which to say that it was worth their time and energy to come beyond my podcast. If that makes sense. Absolutely. So I'm trying to like collab. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, put together uh, these various skill sets yeah. uh, in a way to do a semi-organic audience growth. That that is um, that's the blueprint <clears throat> to me. That, like that's to me. If you get into podcasting because you want a Joe Rogan audience, then you're probably going to quit within a year or two because mm-hmm. it's very difficult and it's very long tail to grow a podcast audience, especially 100 percent organically. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I tell people to like restructure the way you think about it and think about it as a connection tool alone. Like it's the Trojan horse. It's the vehicle through which you get through the gatekeeper of anybody you want to talk to. And you actually can hop out and have a conversation with that person. Um, and it is the ultimate relationship builder, uh, for, especially for people that you, you would think normally wouldn't give you any of their time. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like the, the comp the, the doors that it opens, like I said, like I said, it's that, it's that, it's that Trojan horse. And especially if you <clears throat> build a studio, you know, in your office space or something like that, and you can bring people into that. It, it kind of like gives them a glimpse of your world. Um, it builds insane credibility in your brand to that individual makes them more likely to share the content with their audience. Cause that's one big thing is like interviewing is the first thing. Then you have to have a successful interview and actually ask good, engaging, thoughtful questions that produce a real conversation instead of the scripted things everybody else asks. Mm-hmm. Then you have to create good enough content that's repurposed from that interview in order for them to share it. And then they, you have to come off as an incredible enough person for them to be okay with sending their audience to you. Right. Right. So like, cause that we were a lot of podcasters and one of the big things that they always, they always say is like, I can't get my guests to share the episode. It's like, well, there's a multiple, a multitude of factors that are around that. Number one, you're probably too desperately asking them to share it all the time. And that comes across as needy. Mm -hmm. They're not going to share with their audience because they have no idea what you're going to do with that traffic. Mm -hmm. So why would they share it? Secondly, you're not conducting a good interview. The, The content you're producing sucks. Like they're not, you're not extracting any like nuggets from them, or you're not talking about things that they don't normally talk about that would prompt them to want to share with their audience. If they're going to share stuff they normally talk about, they're just going to share their own stuff while they share your stuff. Right. And then, and then third, you're probably not repurposing the content well enough that makes them go like, shit, this makes me look really good. This makes me look like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I definitely want to post this. Like you should be like, after the interview's done, that person should be coming to you and being like, Hey, do you have any assets from that? Can I have that file? My team really wants to cut that up. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like if you're doing it well, they should, they should be actively at like in asking you like, Hey, uh, Hey, where, is that content done? Can I share that yet? You know what I mean? Like that's, that, that's the, that's the only part of the, 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 the transaction that people don't think about is that you have to be able to also conduct a good enough interview and then be good enough, have a team that's good enough. Like Eric's in the corner over there who goes through and cuts up clips that make that person look good and then shares them with that person that are for that person. Because a lot of people will share. It's like, um, it's like when people give you like swag, you know, and it's just full of their branding and they're, and it's like, I might wear that to the gym if it's nice enough, but like, I'm not just going to wear your shit everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If you, like, uh, John Rulin, a buddy of mine talks about, he has a book called giftology and his whole con, his whole business is about, uh, they plug into like fortune 500 companies and they do, um, gifting, Mm -hmm. for them. So it's one of his principles is like, Hey, if you're gifting something to somebody, don't put your own stuff on it, put their stuff on it, make it to where they want to show it to other people. Cause they're Mm -hmm. still going to think about you every time they do it. You Mm -hmm. know? So that's a huge mistake people make. So when people share content, when people repurpose content for their podcast, they give it to that person. It's like branded with all of their stuff all over it. And it's like, well, this doesn't go with that person's stuff at all. Mm -hmm. You have to think about what the other person wants, what their audience needs. And then that's, what's going to get them to share it ultimately. And like, that's, what's really increasing impressions for us right now is that we, we interview really great people. We have great conversations. We work hard on repurposing great content. And then we do like actual Instagram collaborations with them. And those are our most viewed videos right now. The videos that, that are a hundred thousand views or more or 50,000 views or more, almost every single one of them are collaborations with somebody where they accept the collab and it appears, you know, and that's a perfect example of like, 
somebody scrolling through their feed, seeing like maybe they're a fan of of you, and then they see my face and it says like Travis Chapel and Kaelic and I, and it's like, well, who's this guy? I've never mm-hmm. seen this guy before, right? And same with my audience. My audience goes like, who's this guy? I've never seen that guy before, and they tap in, and then you get exposed to this entire new you know audience of people. So, I, for what it's worth, I know that was a long explanation, but I, for what it's worth, I think that you're thinking about it 100 percent the correct way. I think the most most interesting about what you said, man, they're listening to you is you're really highlighting, in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons that entrepreneurs don't really grow into what's possible uh, for them. And that is because they're so busy trying to serve themselves, they forget that business is in the service of others. Mm. Yeah. So if you're looking at somebody like, oh, I can't wait to get this person on my podcast so they can help me grow my podcast. Yeah. That's the wrong motherfucking question, man. Exactly. The question is, what do you have going on in your life and your business in which my podcast could serve you in accomplishing that? That's mm-hmm. the real question, right? Like if I'm sitting down with somebody and I was going to interview them with a, in a podcast, like, hey, is there something that you want to promote to your audience or something that you want to like a message or something that you want to get out there? And how can, how can I ask you questions that are going to help you achieve that goal, that purpose, that, you know, um, end result that you want to, that you want to accomplish so that they are perfectly then incentivized Mm -hmm. to share the content that we created because it's a it's exactly what they want their audience to hear and see if that makes sense right so it's it's really about sitting there and being of service to them when you talk about you know gifting people last year i threw out some uh, invitations for my 40th birthday party (laughs) (laughs) you you came to it so you know i got i got one (laughs) yeah what a weird (laughs) debacle that party was but um I had people reaching back out to me and they're like, Hey man, I just, uh, um, send me your address. I can't make it, but I'll send you some of my swag. And I'm like, why? Yeah. What I want to wear your brand. <laughs> At you know my birthday like, party. <laughs> yeah. Like, what didn't you, if you're going to do something for me, like throw me some yeah. Louis or something, like it doesn't even send have to be me your nice. address so you can give me some free advertising. <laughs> what? Yeah. Like, right. I'm like, yeah, yeah it, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's so much what it yeah, is. Right. It's, they're always looking for an opportunity that serves them versus looking for opportunities that serve the people that they're supposed to be in service of, if that makes right. sense. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then they wonder why it's not working. Right. Like, oh, they're just they're just selfish. They didn't share that with their audience. And it's like, no. No, like, you're you, being you, selfish. Bro, I have literally had people <laughs> share clips with me from an interview that I did on their show. But when I've gotten some some of those, like literally some of the clips are like, if it's a 60 second clip, it's 45 seconds of, of the them. host talking. Yep. And it's like, dude, why would I share this with my audience? <laughs> like my, it, like if, if I'm sharing stuff, like something for, with my audience and it's me talking, then that makes sense for me to share. But like, if you're just going to talk in the entire clip, why would I like th- this gives me zero incentive to mm-hmm. share this clip with my audience? You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't even look good. It looks like it was edited by a VA in the Philippines, which 90% of them are. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but it's not going to match up with the quality of the, the, the regular stuff that we post. So you're already starting from like a bad position. Yeah. But if the content's really good, then I'll share it. But not when it's <laughs> 45 seconds of you asking a question and 15 seconds of me going like, uh-huh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't make any sense, dude. Like, no, I'm not going to share that. Um, and then they're going to get mad at me because I didn't share it. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? It's like, well, it's a, it's a, it's, it's disrespectful to the other person's time and disrespectful to the other person's audience to assume that they're just going to share everything just because they came on your show. Like you're still in the position of being the person who has to prove value to them. And people think like if they have a podcast, even if it gets a hundred downloads, which most of them do, they have this weird like conception that, that misconception that. I'm doing you a service because I brought you on my show and shared you to my 34 listeners. So therefore you should be willing to share my episode with your 1 million Instagram followers or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, what? This doesn't make any sense, dude. <laughs> like, so short sighted. Some self-awareness. Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. I, I would say like, I think that that's, you know, so one of the um, biggest lessons I've learned probably in business, you know, if you want your business to grow very quick, be so obsessed and focused on creating a product or service that when you deliver it to the customer, they can't help but talk about it. That's the goal, right? Flip. Is that product or service? Flip. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Is that product or service, uh, you know, 
really something that can that in and of itself it is its own marketing material yeah. and i came from the the background of direct response marketing affiliate marketing right and so uh, you know in the, coming from that background everything that i learned was all about you know dollars out dollars back in the door cost per acquisition cost per lead and is a numbers game right and so the all the con- even when i go to most masterminds man you can probably relate to this most masterminds i go to in the in our business space these days it's all the all the conversation is around marketing and sales it's customer acquisition acquisition, customer monetization that's it right but almost nobody talks about retention and so this is one of the things that almost destroyed us in 2018 uh so i was going through a partnership breakup we were we were parting ways there was kind of a legal battle over the business for about eight months or whatever and at that same time this is when i discovered that we were doing like 1.5 to 1.8 million dollars a month and losing three hundred thousand dollars a month and so i was you know really pouring through all the information and trying to figure out what was causing this and one of the things that i started to find was i you know i had never really seen like our refund rates um and uh and really from a from two-sided perspective cash in cash out but customer in customer out became more important more interesting to me like of the Mm. customers that we acquired how many did we actually keep right and i realized that because we had been so aggressively focused we had such a marketing centric business at the time right and all of my energy and attention was there I had forgotten about the other side of the coin, which was the retention piece. And I realized as I'm doing the numbers, I'm like, it doesn't matter how much we grow our marketing at this point because we were never going to be able to outrun our reputation. Like no amount of ad spend will ever allow me to outrun the reputation of the business. And so at some point, acquisition is going to meet attrition. Meaning I'm losing customers as quickly as I'm acquiring customers. And then I might see top line revenue going up, but I'm not building a real business. I have the illusion of growth, you know, and I'm really just a dog chasing my tail. And that's why as soon as I got the the, the company from my business partner, we went from 60 employees to 12 employees over the next nine months. We cut everything back. And I just went to the team and I was like, listen, we're going to get focused on the basics, right? Yeah. Like we got full of ourselves. We got cocky. We grew really quick. We thought, you know, you know we had the Midas touch. Everything we would touch would turn to gold. Yeah. But instead, we're going to focus on keeping the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is going to be customer results and sy- the systems and processes that lay the foundation for the business to scale on top of. Because yeah. I'm not going to go build another business again and scale on, you know, quicksand. Sure. Most people are trying to build an empire on quicksand and they don't even realize it. So yeah. um, when we bre- began to re- uh, really focus on retention as much or more than we focus on acquisition. Now we have like a real sustainable business. And that's the only thing that makes the business valuable as well. If if you have any desire to exit your business at some point, it will be like your value will be greater or less than the amount of recurring revenue that you have coming in. Right. And, and like if you go to, if you go to raise money for your business, one of the core things that investors that know what they're talking about are going to ask about is churn. What's your churn? Right. You know, they, yeah, they want to know CAC. Yeah. They want to know LTV, but like mostly they're, they're interested in churn because you can figure anything else out on the marketing side. And if you can, and if you have really, really, really low churn, then you can estimate your lifetime value of your customer to be extremely high and you can pay whatever you want to acquire that customer. Like the marketing will take care of itself if you focus hard on product, which is one thing that actually I learned building the software company. Um, because there's a lot of things in like the VC world that I just don't like. I don't, I don't, I don't like the idea of like burning capital for 18 years before you make a cent. I don't like, I don't like wildly inflated valuations because the founder used to run a good company. I, I don't, I don't like investing, you know, $75 million into a company that's made $0 so far. Like there's a lot of things I don't like about it. And I think that it perpetuates a lot of bad habits and entrepreneurship. Dude, because- I think it's the next bubble. Yeah, I, I think that I think that we're experiencing it right now. Yeah. I think that that's what's happening right now, currently in that world. Uh, but one of the things that they get right is product. They have a, a very large emphasis on building product rather than marketing and sales and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it taught me a lot about product building because I never thought of it. Never, never really thought of it that way. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, you sell a product, and, and like your ability to sell the product is the number one factor in your ability to scale mm-hmm. because. It, you can't sell the product. Doesn't matter how good the product is, but if the product is that good and people are selling it for you, then to your point earlier about organic marketing, most of your job's already done. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is like turn on the turn on the hose of traffic. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But uh, but most people, especially in the internet marketing world, because the focus is marketing so much, and the um, you know the, the there, there's no uh, there's no there's no award for retention at ClickFunnels. 
There's, you know what I mean? There's, there's, it's, it's always, it's top. What's your top line revenue? Yep. What's your top line revenue? How can we make that look good? Everybody's talking to every, like you see an ad, it's about, it's a stripe, um, a uh, homepage screenshot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not a screenshot of their churn, per, their churn rate. It's a mm-hmm. screenshot of what did we make top line, you know? And to be fair, I think there's a stage for that in every business where you should be focusing on growing top line, even at the expense of profitability or, or uh, potentially losing a couple customers here and there. I think there's a time and place for that. Um, but probably not a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> like yeah. most people are yeah. focused on. I mean, when, when you start to, any business that's going to go through the process of scale is going to run into these constraint points wherein they are seeing revenue grow, but margin diminish. Uh, and that's just part of scaling a business. And most businesses, most entrepreneurs aren't sophisticated enough in their problem solving skills to be able to see their way past that. And that's why so many businesses that I know, like even in, in, in my industry, they end up getting some place of scale where they just, they just can't scale. They, quote unquote, can't scale any further, right? But there's these these break points where you just, you have to, con- you have to be able to problem solve your way through and break past that and be able to find that margin again on the other end of that scale process. Uh, but I, I'm a hundred percent on pay on board with you. And I think that, you know, th- when you look at like the tech world, they, in our digital products, coursing, coaches, experts world, right? Uh, uh, we could probably learn something from the tech world, regardless of their, you know, over, uh, their extreme overvaluations at times. Uh, Dropbox grew because Dropbox created a, a great product. You know, Zoom grew because Zoom created a great product. Uh, their product became their best form of marketing material. It was their only, f- I mean, Dropbox was just the, you, you, you share this, you get free storage. Yeah. Exactly. So simple. <laughs> so simple. And it was just like, oh yeah, why not? Yeah, I'll share that. Yeah. You know? But and all of a sudden they have whatever, a hundred million fucking users. You know what I mean? And they sold for billions of dollars. It's yeah. Like, oh, okay. That that makes a lot of sense. They have infinite scalability and they have a fantastic product. And yeah. then they didn't have to drop a ton of money in ads to grow their business. Right. Like that's why they talk about product market fit all the time. And I think I think a lot of uh, online marketers would be better suited to be thinking about offer market fit. You know, like is this offer good enough? for people to share it without us even prompting them to share it. If the answer is no, then maybe we're not ready to push to a half a million a month. Maybe mm-hmm. we're not ready to push to a million a month. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should really like take six months and button up our processes, our systems, work on fulfillment and find true offer market fit before we start worrying about going and bringing on hundreds or thousands of customers. Um, if you want longevity anyway, right? If you're in it for a quick cash grab, then sure, I guess, you know, do, you, know you do you. But like, I'm not in this game to like burn through bridges and my reputation and be out in three years and like retire in Bali. Like, that's not what I want to do. I want to build a long-term established brand and business where people actually still like me after they do business with me. Right. You know what I mean? And trust me even more. You know what I mean? Not trust me less. But I have a business that we're rolling out right now that we just started to, we, we launched it last year. We just crossed the seven figure mark, um, at about 10 months into it. Uh, and it's, it's in the personal development space. Okay. So it's a, a series of seminars that we do. Uh, it's a seminar that we do here and currently in Vegas, but it's like a local seminar. And then we do a couple of retreats. So okay. right now I'm in escrow on a 322 acre property in East Texas, nice. uh, two hours East of Dallas, uh, that we are acquiring in order to build out the retreats because we just, oh, it's one of the constraint points that we're running into is that we just having a hard, more people want to buy it right now than we have the ability to sell to because we don't have the space. Um, we have to keep finding and leasing space in order to do it and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, the reason that I say this, that, and it ties into what you're saying is, um, that business, that business is more of like a legacy play for me. Hmm. That's like, this thing that I want to leave on earth when I'm no longer here. It's a way that I live longer than my human body. Yeah. Right. Um, and because of that, because I'm taking that, that approach to it of like, where can this thing be in 200 years, which I imagine in 200 years will, we will be a galactic species. And so am I creating a product that's good enough that it could leave earth is a question. Mm. Um, but in our pursuit of that, we're not doing any marketing or sales. So we're doing no advertising for that. The way that it's growing right now is that I just take my customers from my primary business right now that have already grown and I push them over there um, as part of our curriculum. 
and then they end up going into that business and its sales sequence and then they, they upgrade, right? But if essentially that business right now has no cost per acquisition because it has no advertising dollars. <clears throat> um, it's just overflow from one business over to the next. Yeah. And, you know, my team and I, when we've met, we talk about like advertising and marketing and turning on funnels and all these sorts of things to like grow that business. My thing with them right now is that we will do that when we achieve a 10% uh, referral mm. from our customers. So when 10% of our rec- our customers are referring us more customers, because at that point you have like this infinite, if you do the math, you have infinite scalability at that Rowdy point. Rowdy loop. Yeah. Right. And so if 10, once 10% of our customers are referring us another customer, which is starting to, to happen, because I mean, in a personal development world, it's like our classes, I'm not going to say that, I'm going to say that they're really freaking amazing. Uh, and I took the concepts from a, a personal development company that's already been around for 50 years that almost yeah. nobody knows about. And I headhunted some of their best people because proof of past performance, not promise yeah. of future potential. There you go. Um, Bring it back. We, <laughs> Good callback. So we, uh, we, we headhunted some of those people. We brought them in and, uh, you know, the goal is for, like I said, for, for te- to get to a place where 10% of our customers are referring us a customer before we turn on marketing and advertising. Because at that point, I know definitively, you know, through data and numbers that we have created a product that's so phenomenal that customers will refer us more customers without us even asking to. And until yeah. we do that, we're not going to turn on marketing and advertising. And all of these marketing and advertising purists that might be listening to this are going to think this guy's an idiot. No, I'm not an idiot. It's because the reason that I say this is because when the most moment that you turn on ads and you start spending money to acquire a customer, the next th- emphasis immediately becomes sell to that customer. We got to get that money back that we just spent on advertising. And then you become a sales centric business, not a service centric business and service centric businesses are the ones that stand the test of time. I remember watching an interview uh, a while back. I think it was like a three minute interview with Jeff Bezos. And he said the term customer experience 97 times in a three minute interview. I can't watch an interview with most marketers where they say customer experience once in an hour. (laughs) And it's no wonder that then Jeff Bezos goes on to be the richest man in the world. And look at how much he obsessed about the customer experience. He solved a problem that nobody else in the e-commerce was willing to solve, which is or how even do... new existed. Yeah. Well, he's just thinking <laughs> about like, he's so fascinated or whoever on his team is fat. There's somebody in there is sitting around going, what does the customer ult- ultimately want? Well, at some point they must want us to deliver the product before they even know that they want to buy it. Yeah. Right. Cause right. I mean, I'm buying stuff on Amazon right now. And like in 10 minutes, it's at my door. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like Christmas, bro. Every time you open the door, it's like, Oh, Amazon. Yeah. yeah it's like, <laughs> what, wonder I what this get? was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But think about how much they've transformed our customer. Exp- bro, I go online right now and I, I will see like I will see ads from businesses and I'll go look at like a freaking shoes or something that, I, that I'm looking to buy. And the very next thing I do before I buy it is I go, go to see Amazon. If it's on Amazon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I go see if they have a store on so Amazon. Some motherfuckers in this evening, not exactly. in two and a half weeks when you're That's free shipping. That's what I'm my door. saying, yeah. bro. At least at Amazon, I know exactly when I'm going to get this thing. <laughs> so true. Right. Uh, versus like I, you know, use shop pay on your website and Absolutely. I'm like, pray after that. Yeah. It's the shop it's like pay five and pray. To seven days. What are we in the ice age? <laughs> yeah. Like get this shit to my door. Can you imagine <laughs> our ancestors were like horse and buggy across yeah. the freaking country for months <laughs> to get something. And now we're like, I need it today. You guys yeah. didn't even understand. I need toothpaste. I need it now. <laughs> But the degree to which he went and solved that issue for customers and then changed the entire marketplace's expectations around what good service was is the direct, you know, it has a direct correlation to why Amazon is a behemoth of a business right now. He wasn't just e-commerce. He solved logistics. He reinvented the logistics industry. You know, like they have their own fleet of jets that are flying packages places, you know, they have fulfillment, like their fulfillment centers. Like it's so buttoned up that it like, it it is wild. Now it was, it used to be like two days was like two days is a fast shipping. You know, it's like, wow, two days. Sure. Sign me up. Amazon prime 79 bucks a year. You know, now they make, I don't know, billions on in just free cash flow at 79 bucks a year from prime members um, without having to do anything different in their business. But now that it's just, it's so, it's so streamlined. Like you said, it's like, I could order something right now. It'll be at my door in three and a half hours under the guarantee of two day shipping. You know, I was talking to somebody recently. It was funny. Cause like they were defining their experience living in a different country by the fact that Amazon prime wasn't there yet. He was like, he was like, I was like, uh, how's Costa Rica, man? And he was like, you know, it's really cool. We're building a house down here and everything. He's like, but I don't have Amazon prime, which is weird. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, that is a pro. It's like a, it, you, you were so good at solving a problem that now you've created one when your service doesn't exist. 
Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. Talk about product market fit. You know what I mean? It's like now that your your service is not fascinating. Is, yeah, is not available to this person. They're actually upset that your service does not reach them yet because it's that good and it completely changed the way that they did their life. So I'm not gonna lie, man. When we were uh, when we were looking at the property that we're now in escrow on that that ranch, uh, there's a nice little house on it and stuff, and beautiful, beautiful. Like I mean, 322 acres, bro. I saw I mean, some videos lot. on it. Yeah, yeah, it looks um, it's gorgeous spot and my girl was like uh so would you want to like live out here for a part of the year or something and i literally said i don't i bet amazon doesn't deliver <laughs> out here like in the same day <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> you know what about that life you know what i mean like, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if i can go back i don't to want to go that days. far yeah. off the edge you know? i'm not trying to be a caveman <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not ron swanson over here but yeah oh, that's so funny dude well, yeah. Hey, listen, man, I I appreciate you coming out. I know we got to wrap this up. You got some shit to do. I got some shit to do. Um, but before we go, where, where can people go find find you if they want to hear more from Kayala about all the stuff that you know about marketing, sales, affiliate uh, stuff, as well as you know ops. I know you're talking a lot about ops, business growth, hiring, firing people, culture, and all the stuff about running a real business as well. So where can people go learn more from you? Yeah, so I'm fascinated these days and much more excited these days to talk about like the things that actually grow a business long term um, than just regular old marketing and advertising and webinars and all these things. Um, and so if that's something that interests uh, someone, I would say probably the best place to find that content for me, which I give it a t all of it away for free, um, the vast majority of it anyway, uh, best place to find that content would be on YouTube. Uh, where I talk about quite a bit of our different business strategy, both you know mindset and skill set side, and then uh, also Instagram's a decent place um, where people can find me, and I actually respond to my messages there. Well, maybe I won't now because I don't know how many listeners you have, Travis. <laughs> you know, I might have destroyed my <laughs> inbox. I don't know, <laughs> but it's it's Kyle and I at both of them. I mean, just it's it's got somehow interestingly enough because I'm from Hawaii, it has ten letters but thirty two vowels in it uh <laughs> so you'll figure it out it's keala kanai yeah. go look it up Kala. you'll probably only be one uh by the yeah, way if you, if you start typing on... it in i'm sure it'll pop it's k-e-a-l-a -A. yeah right? so if you start typing in keala there's i mean there's not that many keala's out there that are that are reputable well if you do that on instagram that. you'll actually find about 15 different accounts now that are oh, a bunch yeah. of bitcoin <laughs> that scammers yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the one with 90 something thousand plus uh followers is the one that's actually me okay so. sweet so at uh, Kayla Kanai over on Instagram and then Kayla Kanai over on YouTube, YouTube. as well. Um, go check out some of the stuff that Kayla's putting out there. I know that you guys will not regret it. If you're checking this out on Spotify or Apple, don't forget to leave a ra rating or review. Helps us out tremendously. Kayla, thanks for coming on, dude. It's a lot of fun. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir.